Welcome back to the Weekly Juice Podcast. My name is Ryan Bevilacqua. I'm joined alongside here my co-host, Corey Jacobson. Welcome to episode 11. Today, we're going to discuss Burr investing and taking care of five generations in one. We do have a special guest for you that we're very excited to bring on. So we'll intro him in a bit, but wanted to kick it over to Corey. We do have a pretty interesting story to share on your uh, investing side. Yeah. So I'm sitting in front of the TV, like, I guess it was last week, probably Thursday, and I'm looking at the TV and it's like, it interrupted our programming and it was like, oh, tornado warning. And I'm like, okay, like, in this Jersey. Is, well, he, like coming through Philly into New Jersey. Right. So yeah. I knew it was going to impact both. And I, I'm sitting here like, oh, I've heard this before. Like it's yeah. probably nothing. But then I had this thought, I'm like, what if like something happens and this yeah. would be like the first expense or something that would have happened in my property. And lo and behold, like, 30 minutes later, I got a text from my, um, from one of my tenants. And by the way, the storm was like sideways wind, like it was raining up here. I lost power. It was like yeah. 80 mile an hour it's winds. Insane. So she, she texted me. She's like, yeah, so the house is flooded. And, and I'm like, that is such a classic text from tenants. Like you never know if it's going to be like, uh, is my house literally underwater or like it's dripping a little bit. So she sent mm-hmm. me a video and I'm like, okay. This is, you gotta get to work. <laughs> yeah, I got to, I got to call her. I got to figure it out. And I actually called two of my mentors and they told me you don't need to rush over there unless the house is literally, I mean, if the house is underwater, like there's nothing you can do at this point. Right. So I, <laughs> I, uh, you know, kind of like internally freaked out. And then I remembered the story about my basement and I'm like, okay, this isn't automatically going to be a $20,000 expense. I just got to figure it out. So I woke up the next day at 5.30, went over there by 6.30 and figured out that the, the storm windows weren't down and the windows are pretty old. So it turns out I have to replace four windows and it's like, you know, five, $600. It's not the, it's not going to break the bank. And uh, I, you know, it's just something that I have to do. So it's my first like major expense was one of my units. And uh, it's, it's like, I just had to get it done. So I think it's a good segue here because uh, we have our special guest, Ian, and Ian's last name. How do we pronounce this here, Rod? Tavarks. Tavardski. Tavardoski. Ian, Ian, we're going to have him say it for us. Yeah, we're going to have, <laughs> well, have him say it. So Ian, Ian and I, we connected on Instagram, kind of networked, and he has a really, really cool story about he's doing some burr investing in Ohio at a totally different price point with different markets. And he's about our age, about he said he was 27 and he's just got a really, really cool why and his background. And he's really kind of rolling with the investments. I mean, he's well on his journey. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, I guess we should just bring him on now. We'll let him talk a little bit about his background. Yeah. Without further ado, uh, thanks for coming on Ian. And by the way, can you pronounce your last name for us? Cause we just completely butchered it. Yeah, it's Tavardoskaya. Tavardoskaya. Ah, I knew it. That's what I said. Uh, awesome. Hey, just got to say every letter. You can't be afraid of it. It just looks scary. All right. I, that's <laughs> right. We were. We were afraid. <laughs> Could, uh, Ian, um, give us a little background on yourself and, uh, you know, just a little bit about your investing journey, so to speak, and you know, how, kind of how you got started as a real estate investor. Yeah. So, um, you know, I always wanted to be a lawyer. And so I actually, um, I went to law school. Um, I actually went for a year and a half. And when I was in law school, I bought my first property. I was studying tax and real estate law. And, um, you know, when I bought the first property, I looked at the closing statement and the attorney fee was $75 and the prorated rent was 850. And I was like, why am I going to go continue to take on all this debt, continue to, to, to put in all this time studying to then, you know, basically just have to go find people like me that were buying properties to then continuously make a $75 fee. That didn't make sense to me. And my long-term goal was to use the salary from being an attorney to invest in real estate to achieve financial freedom. So I kind of just cut that portion and, and part of it out. I dropped out of law school, um, like that same semester, basically I finished that semester and dropped out. And um, just started pursuing real estate full time, got a job managing apartment communities um, because that first house I managed really badly. Um, And then, you know, just kept growing and and growing from there. 
Cool. So you are from, where are you from? You're from Ohio, correct? And you live in Ohio, right? Yeah. Yeah. Originally born in, in Cleveland. Um, I actually moved out and spent some time in uh, Bethlehem and Allentown by you guys a little bit. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. My wife graduated from Lehigh University. So oh, spent a little what? time over there. And then, uh, you know, I was admitted to uh, OSU Law. So moved back to Columbus for that. And, it, you know, I've kind of been here here since. Awesome. I've been to I've been to Columbus. I actually really liked it when I was there. I happened to be there when OSU was playing Michigan in football. It was insane. It was nuts. But yeah, I've never been, but I yeah, want to go. Yeah, it's it's cool. <laughs> but um, so cool. So you have a full time job, then. So you're doing sort of investing on the side almost, or trying to replace it eventually. Just give us a little bit of of feel for that. Yeah. So um. You know, the idea that I really fell in love with when I was in, in undergrad or college was, yeah, I forget who, who said it, but they're like, you know, someone asked me all the time, how do I be financially free with real estate? And I tell them, go buy a 30 unit apartment community. And they just laugh at me. And I say, no, it's really that easy. If you have 30 units at $600 a month in rent, that's $18,000. If you had to spend two thirds of that money to take care of your rental properties, that would leave you $6,000 a month. Can you survive in $6,000 a month? $72. And like for me, that was just like my aha moment. I was just like, oh, it's that easy. I just buy a 30 unit apartment community. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, over time, I realized though, like, you know, really it's just representation of 30 units. So that can be 30 single family homes, 15 duplexes, you know, any combination in between. And, and you know, $600 a month in rent. But if you're getting seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000, right, obviously that number is smaller. So it was really just the math. Like his point was, you know, this is kind of like a, a number of where you have to be. And it's just that simple. So, for me, I've just kind of always had that idea in mind uh, of what I really wanted to do. So that simple, get to 18 grand a, a month, and that kind of would replace it. But um, yeah, in the meantime, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a full-time job. Honestly, most of the time I've been doing this, I worked a part-time job in the evenings as well. You know, for most of it, I went to a full-time job. I then went and worked on houses for three hours to fix them up. I then went to a part-time job, slept for five hours, woke up and did it day in and day out over and over and over again. Sounds like you really immersed yourself in real estate to learn it and then live yeah. it eventually. Um, and that kind of brings yeah. me to my, to my next point here. And you, you talked about grinding long hours and doing multiple things to, to kind of fund your journey. I saw a tagline on your Instagram, wanted to, to touch on that. Taking care of five generations in one. What does that mean to you? And kind of, can you dive down that rabbit hole? Yeah. So I think that really hits on my why right? You know, like why you want to, you know, why would you want to grind that many hours? Like, why would you really want to do anything? Because I mean, the money and the freedom is nice, but you have to have a reason why you want to enjoy that. And really for me, um, like it's one, I want to take care of my family, but I don't view it as ending with me. Like I want the next five generations just to be set for life. Like they can make their own decisions. They can, you know, if they want to go be uh, an art major and not be an engineer, like that's fine. They can really go truly explore their passion, spend the time to do it not be pressured like I was, you know, to like go to college and find out what you want to do, like right at 18. Um, you know, cause again, like I went to law school, I didn't like it. <laughs> I left. Right. So, <laughs> you know, not, not feeling like you had to, to do that. And um, you know, where the five generations, that's as long as you can make a trust for. So like when I was in law school, right. Like you used to be able to set up trust in perpetuity and forever. You can't do that anymore. So, you know, you can only do it for, for so long. You only basically take care of five generations. So for me, again, like I guess playing off of my backstory, my why and what I want to do, right. You know, it's, it's, I want to take care of five generations as long as I can. And, um, you know, my, my, the YouTube channel I have as well, like I call it young Vanderbilt. And the reason is, is because Cornelius Vanderbilt, like when he passed away, he set up trust for his family and he donated to, to Vanderbilt university. Oh, and wow. he let his family disappear and do what he wants. So for me, like, again, it's all kind of ground in like this kind of like deeper meaning, if you will. Um, if nothing else, it's important to me. And I think, yeah. again, like when you just reflect, like, why would you work 18 hours a day? Like, if you just keep reminding that yourself, even in your own systems that you set up, like, it's just silent reminders. It's like, you guys can laugh at me. You guys don't have to get it because like, you know, I do in my heart and that's what, that's what matters. Awesome. So that's great. I mean, that, that's really powerful stuff. And I think that's going to carry you to be successful. I think you painted a little bit of a future picture. Like you want to get to $30,000 a month, right? That's, that's, uh, I'm sorry, 30 doors, $18,000 a month, correct? Exactly. So can exactly. you, can you, you know, retroactively, I guess, go back to now, what does your portfolio look like right now? And, um, 
how, you know, when did you buy your first property and just like what have happened in the last, I guess, X amount, you know, of, years. X amount of years. Yeah. Yeah. So I bought my first property in 2017. Um, so almost three years ago and it was a, a duplex in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I bought it there cause you know, my extended family, they do have some contractor knowledge and I didn't know how to fix anything at that point. Like nope, I weird. don't even know if I, I didn't even know if I owned a drill, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, my skills were really low. But, you know, I, I was like, oh, yeah, like, I know plenty, thing, plenty of things about, you know, contracts. And I, I read, you know, how to buy this property. Like, this is going to be a great deal. And, um, you know, it has been a good deal for me. But I did a horrible job managing it. So that's actually why when I left law school, I then went into property management. Because I was like, oh, it's great that I know how to enforce these leases. But like, I think the two professions we can all agree on that people don't like is like lawyers and landlords. And somehow <laughs> I managed to hit on both of those, right? So, you know, for some reason, like being a lawyer didn't really help me. So I went into property management and kind of draw on that experience. I did such a bad job managing that property that I actually tried to sell it eight months after I had it. And I tried to sell it on a land contract with seller financing. And nine months after I did that, the guy actually filed for divorce and handed it back to me. So wow. I have it back now. It, since I've got it back, it's been the best performing property I have. Like, I am glad I got it back. But, like, admittedly on that one, like, I gave up too soon, right? Like, because at the time when I had that one, you know, the next thing I bought was a couple of things in Columbus, you know, where, where I live. And I was like, oh, I need to focus here. Like, the distance was just too far. Sure. And, you know, then when I got that property back, I was kind of stuck with the same thing, right? Like, do I sell it again and try to double down in Columbus or do I really focus back and, and try to, to, to do something in Cleveland? So um, I decided to double down in Cleveland and I bought um, this year, I bought five more units in Cleveland. So that puts me at seven in Cleveland. Um, and then in between the time, if you will, of selling that Cleveland duplex and then getting it back, um, I bought five more units in Columbus. So I got seven in each, seven in Cleveland, seven in Columbus. Awesome. Wow. So 14 units. So you're well on your way uh, to, to that goal. How do you, how did you manage to accumulate those properties within a three year span? I think a lot of people would be interested to know that. And we'll get into this because in the Philadelphia market, and you can talk about your price points here. I, if I were to buy, let me tell you this, if I bought a duplex for $40,000, I think you mentioned a fourplex for $40,000. I probably would, it would probably be a pile of sticks. So like, I need to know <laughs> how you, uh, you know, just what your approach was in speed to, four, you know, 14 deals in three years, right? I mean, 14 units in, in, in uh, three years. It's incredible. Yeah. So a couple things, you know, um, like I take a variation on Burr, if you will. So like I do, I do, I do have a little fight to pick with Burr and that, and to me, that's that it requires the use of hard money. And if you've ever tried to go out there and get a hard money loan and you've never done anything before, it's pretty difficult. The it's second is if you're, a, we know that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's expensive and people want to know your experience and all that stuff. You don't have any, it's hard to lean on that. Sure. The second thing with the Burr method is it forces you to learn everything at once, right? You have to learn how to buy it, repair it, and or oversee contractors. Yep. Then you have to learn to rent it. Then you have to learn to refinance it. Like, and if you mess up any of those steps, like you've shot your own deal in the foot. Yep. So what I've done is I've tried to take an extended version of that so I could learn in parts. So I'm, I buy everything with either, either I can finance it with personal loans or credit card. I can secure seller financing. I can use the down payment on a credit card or personal loan against seller financing. So again, I'm zero out of pocket. Um, and I did build a relationship with someone actually that's, that's given me some private money that I've used to buy a couple of deals and stuff like that as well. Um, and then my plan is kind of over a two, three year period, fix up the insides, let the tenants live in them, use the tenant's rent money to fix up the outsides, then refinance it. So that way I kind of learn it in steps. I'm out of money a lot less, um, you know, a lot less out of pocket and learn kind of over time. And then when I pull it back out, because I'll have multiple deals to do at the same time, I can look to really scale and look to get into the small apartment communities or, or bigger multi, or small multifamilies and things like that. Because instead of pulling one deal out and being like, okay, I did this first successfully, I ended up with five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000. Like I project in the next 15 months, I'll have 150 to $200,000 in capital. I'm a lot more dangerous with three years of experience and $150,000 in capital than I am with one deal under my belt at 5,000. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this stuff is, some of this is actually things that Ryan and I are learning as we go along too. like how, 
Can you walk us through um, what, like a specific deal? I think it would be good for yeah. you to, for our listeners and even Ryan and I to understand what your price point is, what your market is, and explain maybe one that you used either a seller financing or a down payment on the credit. I love I love Le- the Lens House deal. Mm-hmm. If you could go into that and just everything from start to finish, and we'll go from there. Yeah. So. Um, Le, you know, Lev's House of Fourplex was brought to me by a wholesaler in November 2019. Um, they won $88,000 for it. Um, I just looked at the pictures, and I think I literally just laughed at them on the phone and um, told them to just bring me another offer. Like, I didn't even count it. I just said, bring me a lower price. <laughs> and I didn't hear from them for two months. You know, they came back, and it was a lower price. It was, you know, like low 70s. And I said, no, you still have to do better. And they said, what's your price point? I said, still do better. And they said, okay, so I don't think I talked to them again for like another 30 days. Um, you know, I kind of hit the point then where early February, that price had gone from, you know, like 88000 to like sixty five. you know, because they were having trouble selling it. And like, um, you know, like part of the reason why you can buy something for 44000 is because it looks like a $44,000 for bike. <laughs> you know, like it, it is not, it is not nice. And the guy had owned it since the, the late 80s. And I don't think he put a penny into it. Honestly, I don't think he put a penny into it in the last decade. And Ian, this um, is just, so, a, just to give some context, this is a fourplex, sure. correct? That that sure. you purchased for, we said Lev, that is your son. And I, it, I, on Instagram, it was cool because I saw that you, Brandon Turner kind of from Bigger Pockets kind of gave people this yeah. idea to pay for your children's college fund. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to give some context to that. And I think, uh, um, I think that's pretty cool where in 18 years or so, you're going to have a bunch of equity in the property or, you know, you 1031 into something else, but go ahead, continue. Yeah. yeah so, um, you know, I, I shot him back a number that said 35,000. So again, we still have a huge gap and we negotiated over end of February, mid, uh, or end of, I'm sorry, end of, um, uh, January through mid February down to that $44,000 number. And, um, you know, for that one, I admit the financing story is, is not that cool. I, uh, I reached out to the guy that had kind of had been, I, I managed his properties in Columbus. He, he offered me kind of some money and just told him I have a fourplex at 44,000. His jaw dropped and he said, okay, here's 44,000. So he has a first position on the house for 44 grand. Um, I have a 10 year mortgage on it. So after 10 years, I'll own it free and clear, no okay. balloon payments, no nothing. Um, and one unit was vacant. So I went through and just, I mean, you know, it was a one bedroom with a weird layout. I turned it into a three bedroom, ripped out all that 15 year old carpet or whatever was in there, you know, hardwood floors and, and it made it look nice, you know, rented it for, for then $700. So, you know, my rehab cost on it because I did the work myself was, you know, it was only a few grand. So, you know, by the end of the year, I'll have made back what I had spent to Ooh, so be happy. What is your, what is your, um, I guess overall cash on cash return on that property. We talk about that term a lot on our show. And then what what does it cash flow at this point? So the first two months I had it before it was occupied, it was at like negative eighty five dollars. So that's where I bought it at essentially, like with the rents that were in there. Got it. Um, so like my you know, and the ones that are occupied, they're at like three thirty five to four hundred a month in rent for these apartments. So very below market value. Um, you know, as it sits this month, the cash on cash or the cash flow is five hundred dollars a month. Okay. I've already given like a rent raise to folks. You know, basically like thirty percent of where they were at. So like my cash flow next month is going to be close to about eight twenty five. Awesome, awesome. So that's that's creative and like not only creative but also he's he like you showed your patience with that. You didn't just say, oh well, this deal is not going to work because it came back at a certain price. Like you you know, thought about it and said, hold on, I know the price that I need to get this property. I think that's pretty cool. You put sweat equity yeah. into it, right? You didn't outsource and, and bring other people in. You did it yourself. Um, we talked about you were less as a hands-on guy in the beginning. Now you're much more of a hands-on guy. How much, how much would you say working in property management has helped you in your investing journey and getting more hands-on rather than taking a backseat? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's definitely really helped on the property management side, but I'll say it was pretty limited in that. And that's just because like, honestly, like I sit at a desk and I deal with leases, right? right? So like, I'm not fixing electrical outlets. I'm not painting apartments. So you're not learning those skills, but it does put you around people that do it all the time. 
So, like, if I do get stuck on stuff, like, I'll take pictures and just send them to my maintenance guys. Hey, how would you do this? How would you do that? Got it. Um, you know, for, for, like, what I did is when I first learned to install, like, hot water tanks, I paid a maintenance tech to go with me for the first two. So I watched them how to do it. Third one I did myself. So it does kind of give you those resources of people that you can, like, bounce off of and kind of trust. And if you will, like, kind of vet them up front. Um, so, I mean, that's been – you know, that, that's been helpful. And yeah, I mean, the sweat equity just makes the, the deal great. Um, we talk like, you know, even con going to contractors and there's this big looming word contractors, everyone seems to have an issue. Um, <laughs> how do you, how would you say that you find and grow your contractor list organically? I know that was a theme in one of your videos here. Yeah. So, you know, what, like, I don't like calling people. Like, I'm just going to be honest. Like, you know, like, if, if you're going through my day, right, like, especially now, like, I have a newborn, I have a full-time job, I have 14 units that I own, and then I'm managing 11 others for other people. Like, yeah. I don't have time to sit on the phone all day and wait for people yeah. to call me back. So, <laughs> Dude, you know, and they won't call you back. <laughs> they won't call you back. Yeah, That's yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> or, we'll call me back, I'll talk to them for 20 minutes, and then they got a big ego, and they want to charge me, like, $5,000 to install a hot water tank. Like, it just, it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put an ad out on, on Facebook or on Craigslist. It's like five ten dollars It's it's cost virtually nothing. Yeah. And you get a, a, a huge amount of inquiries from other people that say they're interested in it. So I'll email them, I'll call them. And again, I'm only looking for one person. So generally the first five people that contact me are the first five people I'm going to reach out to. And I'll just ask them, like, this is what I need. Do you understand what I need? You know, most of the time they're like, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, just uh, ask them, like, all right, tell me when you've done this before. Like if they can't tell me when they've done exactly that before, like I don't, I don't want you to do it. Like I don't want you to learn on my house. Like my house is my training wheels. It's not yours. And yeah, so, absolutely. That's fair. Um, you know, find the next person. Then when I do find that person though, you know, like a good example is I needed a little bit of cement work done on the just outside of my house. A gutter had been installed wrong. It had just deteriorated a piece of the sidewalk. I just needed that fix. Like it's not a very hard job, but like if you've never done or patched sidewalk before, um, and not a good time to learn. So <laughs> put it out there, found somebody pretty quickly, found somebody reasonably. Um, the other great thing about, you know, doing this method is I can control like what I want to charge them because I can, or how much I want to pay. Right. Cause I can put that in the app. So like, I'm going to find someone that has the skills to do it, but I'm also declaring up front like what my price point expectations are. So that helps for me, like weed out the person that's going to tell me, you know, they want $2,000 to fix this little section of sidewalk. Like yep. I told you I'm paying $200 for it. So like there's some negotiation room at 200, but 200 to 2000, like don't even bother responding. Yep. Um, but then I make an Excel spreadsheet and I just call or email every single person. Say, hey, I filled this job, but this is what I do. This is what I have. Um, you know, what skill sets do you have? Would you have someone you can re refer or recommend? And then I'll just keep that list. So then the next time I do it, I don't have to go spend that, you know, 5,000 or I'm sorry, that $5 to, to post another ad or, you know, if something comes up that's unexpected, you know, like in your intro, like if I had a basement that floods, right? Like I at least have a starting point that I could go to of contractors that could help me out with that. And if there's no one in my list, like, again, they may know somebody. So just constantly like asking for referrals and things like that um, along the way is, is really how I built that list organically, right? Post first, interview, document everybody, ask for referrals and repeat if I'm missing somebody. But that's, it's been successful for me and it's helped fill in the gaps of the teams that I have. That's awesome. I, I need to take, I, I mean, that, that's amazing advice and something that I need to take. Cause I can't tell you how long I've spent trying to reach out to contra contractors, not having them call me back, texting them twice a week. And I'm like, this is a waste of my time. And you just told me how much you protect yeah. your time. You have a new, you have a full-time job. You got 14 rentals, you manage 11. Like that's, you know, you're busy. And I, to tie back into how busy you are, I'm wondering if, how we talked about the contracting part of it, but are you using some of your property management, uh, your job, you, you manage, you, you mentioned that a wholesaler, you know, reached out to you about the specific deal. How are you finding these, uh, you know, are these deals coming to you? You said you don't like to call people. I'm just curious how you're, how you're navigating that. Yeah. So, you know, because my strategy is pretty much, you know, like I want to go as little money into the deal as possible. Right. So because I'm looking for owners that are willing to carry part of it or a deal that, you know, like I bought a house right down the street from the fourplex for uh, $11,000, like a whole, a whole house, a whole house. <laughs> $11,000. Dude, what was the house I made I replaced out of? my water heater for $11,000, dude, <laughs> because I'm an idiot. <laughs> 
Oh, oh my god. god. Wait, now, the, the 10, not whatever it was, my, uh, my AC unit. Not the water heater. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. like, and I did the whole. You had a new AC. Yeah. The old furnace and AC unit, whatever. It was about 10 Gs. And the fact that you just bought a house for about that is mind blowing. So please continue, sorry. Yeah. Now I do got to evict that tenant and COVID-19 slowed me down. So like I haven't made any money on that house, right? But I mean, I financed it with a credit card and I put it to a zero balance transfer. So like my payment on that house is like $102 a month. You know what I mean? Like I can basically sustain that like forever. Like obviously the interest kicks in eventually, but yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like you have, I have 18 months from the time I bought it. So like I can go for a while, you know what I mean? And, um, and there's where the property management experience comes in, right? Like somebody doesn't want to deal with evicting the tenant. Like, Absolutely. I mean, like that's a Tuesday for me. Like, <laughs> so it's not, yeah. it's not like I don't know those steps and those processes and it's not an unfamiliar territory with me uh, or for me. So it like that piece of it, you know, really benefits and I'm able to draw from that. But um, yeah, I got one for you. So you're well on your way in your journey here, right? But I think you said you started about three years ago ish, three, yeah. four years ago. What advice would you give to someone that is right in the beginning stages, the inception stage of like, they're like, Hey, listen, I think real estate is the vehicle I want to take to be financially free, but I don't know where to start. Like what steps would you suggest that they take to, you know, take off as quickly as possible? Yeah. So I know everybody says read and educate yourself. And I feel cliche saying that, but honestly, like you, you do have to read and educate yourself, but like, I would not start reading real estate books. You know, like, I think, you know, like, so the, when, for a three-year period in college, like, I read over, like, 200-some books or whatever. And, um, like, most of those were not real estate related. They were business. They were finance. It just kind of, like, sharpens your mind because, like, real estate is an avenue of business. So if you're saying, like, I, I think I want to start in real estate, but I don't know where to get started, like, I would start on, like, Read, read about retirement, read about estate planning, like read about financial literacy, read about general business, like, you know, go, go read, you know, Bill Gates autobiography and like those types of, of, of entrepreneurs, like just kick your mind thinking in a different direction and then dive into some real estate stuff because, you know, to me, starting with like a business foundation, because real estate's just a section of, you know, of business, like you're running a business. If you go in and you're like, I know everything about houses, but you don't know anything about running a business, you know, like when you first start out, like, I'm my own accountant, right? Like, I mean, like I have someone that does accounting work, but like I keep my own books. So, like, you know, you have to do all these things. Like you're your own negotiator. You're your own salesperson. Like those are all hats that you have to wear. And so you can know how to burn a property all day and you can know how to install your own windows. But if you don't know those pieces as well, like you're, you're going to struggle to be successful. Awesome. That's really, that's really cool. So I think one of the things we talked about is the different market segments. And when you say you bought a house for $10,000, I'm thinking, wow, my, I have a car that's worth that. And I'm not necessarily proud of that. Maybe I should sell it. But um, the point is, is that I, one of the price points on one of my properties was uh, 250, around $250,000 and then another one in, in Jersey that was under the $200,000 mark, but nowhere near your, what you're talking about. So would you recommend for, you know, I think it's a lot, it's easy for some investors to get started in their own area, but do you recommend long distance real estate investing for whether it's somebody like Ryan and I, or somebody else that says I can go buy in Cleveland, Ohio, and I live in Philadelphia. Is that a smart move for somebody who's just starting out, you know, in their first couple of investments? So I think realistically, if you're more than 45 minutes away, it, to me, that's long term, that's long distance investing. And so am. <laughs> you know, yeah, so because realistically, like now you're suddenly getting to a whole day to get there, right? Like, I, put, I guess put it this way like, if you had to go light the hot water tank, how far are you willing to drive? Like, that really takes no effort, right? It's just pushing a button. But, like, my first duplex was in Cleveland and I live in Columbus. Am I going to go drive four hours to light a hot water tank? Like, for me, the answer is no. Yeah. I'm like, I, so, like, to me, then that makes it long distance investing so like would i recommend it absolutely like if you really want to get into to real estate investing right like essentially again like you're you, especially in the beginning with one like tenant or two tenants like you really can manage most of that on your own like you may need to pay for a couple things you know to deliver a notice and things like that but you know you can collect rent online most part people email and text things to you you know like you you really don't need 
that heavy of a physical presence. Like even with the properties that like I have in Columbus, you know, most of the time I text, email, um, like the majority of all my communication to them and, and, and they're fine with that. We sign leases online. So it, it's not like, like being here, if you will, it's not like I do that any different than I would the houses in Cleveland. So if the, if the investment makes more sense, like go where it makes sense, fill in the pieces you need, you know, as you go or afterwards. So say something does go awry for your, you know, something in Cleveland, one of your properties, how, who do you call at that point? Like, do you have a, a network out there that you're like, okay, I have a guy that's boots on the ground. He's got my back. Or are you worried about, okay, I got four hour drive here just to light a furnace. What, what do I do? Yeah. So honestly, like I'd go back to that list from Craigslist. Like that's, <laughs> that's really what I do. You know, like if it legitimately was just light a hot water tank, like I would just, you know, call people and just be like, Hey, I'll give you $25. Are you going to be in this area? Go light this hot water tank. Like it takes them five minutes. Like it's not that, that big of a deal. Like same thing with unclogging a drain or things like that. You know, um, you know, I, uh, like on my Instagram, I have like my, my maintenance checklist and things like that. Like for Cleveland, I'll do that too. This is what I'll pay. This is the exact items that I need you to go through. Look, look at, take pictures of, um, you know, if you need supplies, send me a receipt and I'll reimburse you for it. And, and, for me, like that's easy enough, you know, and, and tenants for the most part, like organize or orchestrate when they're going to be home. So now like my effort or time into it is, is just making sure I find someone that's going to do it. Organizing when the tenant's going to be home, letting the maintenance guy or contractor know when they're going to be home and then paying them when it's done. And that's it. And to me, that takes way less than four hours. So if it's going to take less than four hours, why would I drive back and forth? Exactly. Yeah. Sure. I, no, that's a great point. I, I had, to, to go off one of the last things you just said, I had a, a problem I was talking about at, in the intro, one of my properties. And um, because of COVID, I've had some issues with rent there. I'm wondering if you felt that not only you've gotten better at this as you've scaled from zero to 14 properties, but has it gotten easier for you? And I'll give you the, the reason why I'm asking this, because I ha only have a couple units. So when something goes wrong or somebody doesn't pay, it's 30 or 25 or 40% of my income coming in. But I've spoke to one of my mentors and he's like, look, when you get to 10, 12, 15, 20 exactly. units, one or two things go wrong. It's a lot easier to, to take that hit and you're, you're, you're not as highly leveraged, so to speak. So um, I'm curious if you felt that you've not only learned, but has, has your process and your systems gotten easier as you've scaled from zero to 14? Yeah, they definitely have. Um, you know, I think too, it's just, like for me, anytime somebody says I have an emergency, the first thing I do is tell them to take a picture of it. Because, you know, like well, you mentioned like, in your intro, like, see if it's an emergency. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, I mean, it, it, you know, because, um, you know, in the first, you know, you mentioned in your intro, like, my house is flooded. Like, <laughs> like most of the time, it's like a dripping faucet. Like, and even at my day job, the amount of people that are like, I have water running down my steps. And you're just like, oh my gosh. And maintenance goes over there like, yeah, just their toilet was running continuously. I just pushed the flapper down. Like, and that was, <laughs> yes. oh, that was wrong. So, like, it is an over-exaggeration. I don't think that that's cynical on tenants' parts. I think a lot of landlords, like, think that's, like, them being cynical or thinking, like, they tenants have to exaggerate for a tenant to respond. Like, if tenants are doing that, that's because you train them to respond like that because you weren't repairing to begin with. Like, yep. tenants don't know how to make repairs. Like, that you're the expert in making repairs. So for them, like it may seem like an emergency, but most of the time it's really not. So again, take a picture of it. Let me know what it is. And then like, I know how to respond to that accordingly. Because to me, like, again, this is, these are my houses. This is my business. Like I'll respond like the way that's appropriate for me, the way that makes sense for me. Like, and, and as long as you kind of communicate that up front, like I found that for the most part, like tenants are okay with that. You know, if you tell them like, Hey, look, great. You sent me the picture. That's awesome. This is what I think it is. This is what we're going to do. They're like, oh, okay. They're responding and they, they care. Yep. Um, I, I'm the rent piece. I still don't like when no one pays rent, <laughs> yeah. no, but exactly. you know, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt as bad. You know, when you have, if one person doesn't pay rent, you have 13 others paying you rent. You know, it doesn't hurt as bad as if you have, you know, two units and um, you know, particularly when I first started out like that duplex, like, because I financed all of it, like I needed both people to pay rent every month to be able to afford the financing piece yep. of it. Cause I used a credit card and a personal loan. So like I needed them both to pay. So when they didn't like it hurt, cause then that was money coming out of my pocket. So um, I think it all just depends too on like your own risk tolerance. 
Yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting that you say that, and it's and it's almost a learning point for me because I'm now I've learned how do I need to respond, and it's not a control thing, but it's like this is my property, right? So I think I'm gonna learn how to properly just respond to someone when they say there's an emergency, and the reason why I say that is because. Um, there's a, a stigma about getting into real estate. It's like, I don't want to be a landlord because I don't want to wake up at 2 a.m. to go fix a toilet. It's like, hold on a second. You don't have to do that. And if you do, then you're probably not managing the properties the right way. I mean, would you agree? Yeah. So in three years, I've never had like a 2 a.m. phone call. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like I, 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 like, I tell all my tenants, like, don't, don't text me after 8 o'clock unless it's an absolute emergency. Um, I've had one person text me at like 8.30 and they said their, um, you know, their furnace wasn't working. I just called someone, they went over there, they made the repair, you know, it was over and done. So, um, you know, like, like That's awesome. yeah, I, I think everyone's always worried about, you know, 2 a.m. toilet calls. Like, yeah, it's, kind of really <laughs> it's not a, like, I don't know if it's a myth, but I think what Ian is saying and kind of what I'm echoing is that if there's something that happens in the middle of the night, there's a 1% chance that it's something that you need to jump out of bed and go, and guess what? If your house is burning down, like call the fire department, like you're not going to be able to stop it. Right. I mean, that's, that would be horrible, but I'm just saying like, there's not, there's not a lot of situations where you need to jump out of bed because there's a leaky faucet at 2am, you know, that brings me to yeah. one of my points here. It's, when you jump into the real estate sector from say, Hey, I have nine to five and now I'm working on investments. You have to start really understanding how each property works and every intricate factor. So you mentioned um, a maintenance checklist and then also um, estimating rehab costs. How does one learn that? Is there a specific book you recommend? Do you go online? Like that is something that's super daunting. I, I believe for anyone that's not super hands-on and they don't want they'll see the first price online and be like, okay, I'll go with that. So how do you personally deal with it? So like what I did is I, I went in the house I live in with a tape measure and I measured everything. And then I started looking for parts to replace it. So, you know, like to me, it's like, okay, how much does it cost to redo the flooring in a living room? Well, like go measure your current living room. Go look at ceramic tile, go look at carpet, go look at vinyl flooring and just estimate it out. You know, the reality is, is like to do your floor or do a floor of the same square footage in a rental property, it's gonna cost the same. Um, like, and that's on the material side. Like, again, it depends then if you're contracting it out or you're gonna do it yourself. But like, I have a, a list on Amazon and at Home Depot where like I just save faucets, light bulbs, light fixtures, like everything. And so if a tenant, if I go into a rehab and I'm like, hey, I need a, a faucet. Well, I just go on Amazon, I order it, it's, it's at my house in two days and I go put it in. Um, and I already know like what, what it is and, and roughly how much that's going to cost me. But, you know, so that, but that's just where I would do again, like start with every room in your house, go to your bathroom, you know, like measure oh. your bathtub and figure it out. So some of your systems are being created by your, the experiences that you have. You're like, Oh, I had to fix this. Now I saved it as a list. And now I know what I need to do when I go back to it. I mean, I think that's, that's kind of what you're saying, right? Yeah, well, I think too, you know, like as you, you know, for, for the, for, I don't, it only really matters where you, you've lived in the country for the last several years, like the market's been rising. So you've had opportunities if you've been investors to make some updates and increase your rents, yep. um, you know, and, and I don't even know even in the current condition that that's not true, just because like we're still doing that in the, uh, the apartments and we're still renting them out. So, you know, to, to me, it's like, okay, that, you know, that faucet with the old plastic knobs on it. If I take that out and I put a $30 faucet from Amazon, like it just looks nicer. It looks cleaner. So, you know, in part from doing unit turns in part from looking at things and as well, just like, look at what you like, you know, if you like chandeliers, you know, like I, I found a chandelier on Amazon. It's like $47. You know, it's been a rental for like two years. It, it looks nice. Is it super fancy? No, but you know, if you like chandeliers, like odds are someone that's going to rent from you is probably going to like chandeliers too. Um, that's a good point. So, you know, add, add it in there and just, again, search them, find them, and, you know, go room by room in your own house. Cool. cool. I have two thoughts here. Um, Cause you mentioned a lot, um, not to tailor it too far back here, but we talked about learning business, right. And, and researching not strictly on real estate. A lot yeah. of people ask us the perks, the pros and cons of using an LLC and buying it under an LLC. 
And I'm wondering if you can dive into that and just give us your thoughts if you have any of your properties held under an LLC and the benefits that you see. In addition, you're one of the first people that has mentioned buying with a credit card. I'd love you to dive into that. I think that's super interesting. Um, we had a, our, one of our previous episodes, we discussed pretty much everything credit cards and that would be a nice segue too. So. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I do have an LLC. I have a couple of properties in my personal name. So the first, the duplex and the first two single family homes I, I purchased are still in my name. I never transferred them over. I really like, I don't think it's necessary. Um, like, I think if you have a And you're a lawyer, by the way. You, or you know law, by the way. So you're somebody yeah. good to take advice from. <laughs> almost lawyer. <laughs> almost. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Half, half of a lawyer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, I think if you have a, like, you do an LLC, like, there's no tax benefits, in my opinion. Like, there, there's no tax benefits in having an LLC. Like, it's uh, it's liability. Like, you, you purchase it for liability reasons, or you, you put it under for liability reasons. So if you have enough of an insurance policy that covers you, it, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily a necessity. Um, like I made the decision to start doing that because I think it created a buffer. You know, like when people, people, um, they fill out their lease and says Pathfinder Estates. Well, like I'm the only person that has, you know, like that owns Pathfinder Estates. But like when tenants ask, like I always say we, we yeah. have to make a decision. Yeah. I will ask. It's a company. You're not paying rent to me. So it like it creates that buffer, if you will. And I don't really view that as being dishonest. Like I view it as giving myself a, a chance to step back and think. Yeah. Because like I don't know the answer to everything. Like even even in dealing with you know 400 unit plus apartment communities and the volume that brings with tenants, like situations are new. You also have to ask yourself like. You know, it, it's easy to say, like, I would do this. And then it actually happens. You have to think a second, like, would I really do that? So, it, like, it gives you a second to say, like, yeah, we'll think about it. And then come back and then make a decision. And you can do that within a 24-hour time frame. You're still being incredibly responsive. You're still providing good customer service. But you gave yourself a chance to calm down, think it through, you know, ask questions to mentors or, or other people in the space and, you know, and and, and go from there. So, awesome. Cool. The, uh the one other thing was the yeah, purchasing just briefly, if you could just describe uh, what maybe your idea was, how you got started with purchasing on a credit card. And I think some people would think like, Oh no, I would never do that. And I've honestly, I haven't heard many people do it. So I think it's really cool to learn just what your experience has been. Yeah. So it started, I guess, as kind of like a challenge because I read, um, I forget who I read it from, but they're saying they were teaching people to buy real estate in the eighties. And they like, we're doing a class there, like, put your hand up if you have a credit card. And like, everyone put their hand up. They're like, put your hand up if you're buying real estate with a credit card. And no one put their hand up. And he's like, why aren't you doing that? You know, and credit cards have changed a lot since then. And like, his point was like, you can't really buy real estate on credit cards. Like when he, in this, this article or this book, and I was like, challenge accepted. Like, I will do that. <laughs> so, you know, what I, what I found is that, like, if you start out with, uh, like, let's say you get a credit card, you know, getting a few thousand dollar balance. I think for the average person that has a salary, it's not that difficult, you know, getting a two, three, four, five thousand dollar balance. And if you start with doing some seller finance deals where you negotiate, that's the amount I'm gonna put down. Well, then you trans you do a, a cash advance. So you pull out the five grand, you put that money down in the house, open up another credit card, do a balance transfer for the eighteen thousand dollars or the five thousand dollars, I'm sorry. So now you have um, you know, like 18 months to pay that back at 0% interest. So you use the rent to pay the seller financing and the credit card. Well, like that's what I started doing. And that credit card now has like a, uh, uh, just over a $20,000 balance. Because the credit card companies were like, wow, he's using his whole credit card. Like I'm right. going to give him more. So that means that just opens more avenues. The second benefit what I've started exploring now is my LLC has been around for a couple of years. And people are saying like, we can get you business credit based on how much personal credit you can get. So now because I've been using personal credit cards and, and things like that along the way, like the amount of personal credit I have like looks bigger. So that means I can get more business credit. Well, now if I take business credit and personal credit, like I can buy even more real estate. Yeah. So, you know, it, I don't think it has to initially be like, you know, it was great that I found that house at $11,000 with a credit card, but it doesn't have to be that. You can combine and stack these methods, right? Like the first house I, first duplex I bought was a personal loan plus a credit card you know, seller financing plus a credit card. So even in more expensive markets, like I still think it works, 
even when you're not finding 11,000 in a house, like yeah. you just have to get creative with it. You have to be able to combine it, you know, with something else. And those, those deals are available. Um, you, cool. you just have to, you just have to look for them. Well, this is awesome. I think, I mean, it's, it's pretty evident that you're extremely knowledgeable on the topic. And even though you've only been doing this for a couple of years and uh, you know, you're before, you know, you're under 30, just like us, but I have no doubt in my mind, you're going to get to that $18,000 cash flow a month in no time. And I'd like to, to, to ask you how, how close are you to it? Like what's your cash flow number now? And you know, then you can probably project on how, how long it'll take you just based on scale to get there. Yeah. So like right now I'm averaging about 250 a door. Okay. Uh, so that like, that's what essentially like my monthly cash flow after expenses. Got it. Um, and you know, part of that is though, is like I'm self-managing. So like when I'm doing my, you know, financing, if you took out like a hundred dollars a month of management fees, I'd be at 150. Right. So, you know, for me, like I do plan to keep self-managing, you know, for a while. Um, but you know, for me, when I hit 20 units, I'll have essentially replaced my, my salary and I'll kind of, you know, back out and, and go, you know, full time at it and finish off the other 10, you know, for me, that 30 unit mark is, you know, my goal and my, like, if you will, financial freedom number, like I get a cake or something at that point. So <laughs> a cake. All right. That's awesome. That's just a plan. Well, it, it, uh, this is, this has been awesome, Ian. I think, um, part of the things that we talk about, some of the things that we talk about in previous episodes and we've mentioned it with a number of guests is how we're putting our message in the universe, which is creating this organic networking tool. And we're thankful to be, to meet people like you through the internet. Right. And now Ryan and I know somebody who does, who's, you know, I don't care how long you've been doing this, man. You're a really experienced investor in Ohio and who knows what can come of that just by putting your message in the universe. Look, we connected you reached out and now you have a connection, although you already knew people in the Philadelphia area. Now, you know, more investors and I think it can only help your business. And I think both of ours. So we're, I mean, I'm ecstatic to, to just have gotten this far and hopefully we can continue conversations and who knows where it goes. Right. So that, that I think is just a, a testament to putting your message out there in the universe and just being like, look, this is what I'm doing. This is what Ian does. When anyone thinks of investing in Ohio, they might, I'll think of Ian, right? So, um, oh, I, absolutely, I agree. You know, like I, um, like I told someone today on Instagram, they're like, you know, I wanted to learn more about what you're doing. I was like, just ask. Like, I don't have a course to sell you. Like, I'm literally just like talking about this because, like, like I love it. Like, I, I love real estate. I love real estate investing. Like, I do it, you know, 15, 18 hours a day. Um, so, like, I don't, I don't mind talking about it. And you do. You meet people from different avenues that. You know, they, they did it once, they do it again. Everybody has advice and you know, real estate's one of those things that I think it is different than a lot of other business because like even people that are in other sectors, they like real estate still. You know, like I think that's really different than if you look at like e-commerce. Like e-commerce is hot, but like if you're not like, I'd want to get into drop shipping, like not a lot of people want to listen to you talk about the drop shipping store. <laughs> but like even people that are drop shipping are like, oh yeah, like I'll hear about real estate investing because you know, people acknowledge how great of an investment it is. And yeah, you, you build that network over time and it's, you know, amazing things come from partnerships. Uh, Absolutely. So yeah, whenever you find that apartment complex, you just call us and we'll, we'll go in. Yeah, if you found another 10K, slide, <laughs> slide your way. Slide my way. I mean, uh, I am, that one hurts me forever. <laughs> I love it, man. Do you want to go yeah, into, sure. yeah. So the last, basically when we uh, start winding down the show, we have a segment called The Last Drop. And Specifically, I'd like to ask you, you know, we already talked about advice for, for young investors, but it's interesting to see you kind of, it kind of seems like you have a well-oiled machine and you're pretty efficient with everything you do. So I was wondering if you could shed some light on a few resources that help you manage your day and more efficiently um, that someone, you know, newer investors could take advantage of as well. Yeah. So um, like one bigger pockets is huge. Like I, you know, I don't consider myself to have a mentor and that's because there's not like a single person, if you will, that like I call when I have questions, like I really do Google stuff. And most of the time I end up at bigger pockets. So like, it is a really, it's, it's a really good resource. You know, it, it really is. And it, it, it covers a lot of topics. Um, I will say, I think bigger pockets has grown so much. You have to begin to know what you're searching for. Um, you know, like if you don't know what you're looking for, like bigger pockets can send you down a rabbit hole. Um, so I guess that's, you know, where I'd go in the, the precaution as well. Um, 
you know, the other thing I'd say is, is download like the Home Depot and the Lowe's app or the hardware stores like around you, you know, begin building that list of, you know, maintenance supplies and, and things like that. Because, you know, even tenants will ask me, like, can you install a ceiling fan for me? Like, sure, I'll install a ceiling fan for you. You know, it's going to cost this much. Well, if I have the Home Depot or Lowe's app, like I can look that up right away. Cool. Um, yeah. And then the third kind of resource I, I'd say is like get, an online property management software. So there's free softwares out there. Cozy, Zillow, you know, just to name a few. Like, it, like I use Cozy. I log all my maintenance orders in Cozy. I log all my expenses. I log all my income. So like at the end of the year, when I have to do my taxes, I just go pull a couple of reports from Cozy. It gives me how much I made on the property, like how much I spent on it. Like, you know, doing those things do take work throughout the year, but you know, they, they save time in the long run and, and they make it easier if you know where to go and pull the information. Like nothing's worse than before I started doing that, trying to dig through like 120 Lowe's receipts, oh. like to, to find something. Yeah, it's, it's brutal. It's brutal. Well, Ian, we, um, I want to thank you for coming on. And I think it, I can tell that you're, uh, I can tell that you're highly spirited about what you do and really happy. And that makes us happy because we talk a lot of time about getting your time back. Right. I mean, the whole reason that we're in this real estate game is to get our time back uh, and to do the things we love. You happen to love real estate. So it kind of all ties in and so do we, so that's great. But um, it just, it, it, uh, it makes me happy to know that there's people out there that are doing what they love every single day because there's too many people on the, uh, in this world that, wake up and go to their nine to five and are miserable and aren't taking the steps in the right directions to, to, to fix that. So it's, it's awesome. I want to thank you for coming on and we got anything else, Rye? Couldn't I mean, have said it better. No, thank yeah. you so much. I, I said it, I'll say it time and time again, people that give back are what make the world go round and it's, you can tell you're a good person and it's just amazing that you're sharing your wisdom and uh, you know, advice from your journey. So we truly appreciate you and it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. And, you know, we'll stay in touch and keep chatting real estate. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. Thanks.